Hi everybody, welcome to Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Patricia Calhoun, filling in for Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for joining us. Let's get a quick take on Denver officially submitting its bid this week to host the 2016 Republican National Convention. Denver's competing with six other cities, including Las Vegas and Kansas City. Alicia Caldwell from the Denver Post, bringing reason to my usual chair. Do you think Denver has a chance to win this? Absolutely. Um, as, as everyone, I'm sure, will recall, Denver was the site of the 2008 Dem uh, Democratic National Convention. Clear that the city has the infrastructure um, to handle such a thing, convention space. Um, the politics are also interesting, too, in that, you know, Colorado had for many decades been a Republican state insofar as the presidential election was concerned. Um, the last two times around, however, um, the top uh, top line went to President Obama. It, it would be an it would be a chance for the Republican Party to test drive its turnaround strategy. Um, in it, but you know the the big problem I think is Las Vegas. Um, Sheldon Adelson is pushing hard. He's a big Republican donor, pushing hard for Las Vegas. He also owns a casino and a convention center, so we'll have to see. And Brad Jones, you're in a unique position to discuss whether Republicans can really party. Political pundit, paramedic, what do you see? To, what are the chances? <laughs> um, well, I, I do like the optics of bookending the Obama administration, you know, with the Republicans coming to, you know, where he was um, ordained as, as um, the guy who would be the president for the next, you know, eight years. But uh, I think, you know, it's interesting, the thing about Las Vegas, well, all of the other finalists, I think the RNC should have really telegraphed that Denver is a really good choice. They almost pretty much gave everybody who submitted a bid a spot in the you know final, so we really didn't get any sense of what they're thinking. Um, I, I know Sheldon Adelson is actually very much against internet gambling for obvious reasons. Um, so I think just the leading candidates should all come out right now for legalization of internet gambling, and that'll put that to rest. And also, if you've ever been to the Sands Convention Center, it's dingy and horrible. So uh, those are two reasons not to do it in Vegas. Um, my question, though, is, is Denver Police Department going to get all new tanks like they did the last time that they rolled through town because the feds just shower all kinds of militaristic uh, spending on, on the local police department? Or, you know, will they go to Arvada or something like that this time around? But I, I love it. Ed C. Lover from the Denver Business Journal, is legalized pot alone enough to bring the Republicans here? <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly how much of an attractant would that be, and I'm not sure by 2016 that we'll be one of only two states with legalized pot. But the important thing is that any of these eight cities can physically host a national political convention. I think where national conventions go are about statements. And so I think how this year goes will tell you whether or not the RNC can host it. If they see a chance to spin this message, as Brad alluded to, of the, you know, we were here at the start of the Obama campaign, we're a different state now at the end of the Obama, you know, uh, legacy, then, uh, you know, if you see us uh, voting Republican uh, in the governor's race or in the Senate race, um, then I think we actually have a better chance because they can say, Colorado, we're going to have our convention in the state where we're coming back around after eight years of Obama. And Eli Stokels from Fox 31, political reporter, what do you see our chances as? I think they're as good as anybody else. I mean, I think after the last election, Republicans have a lot of, in a presidential election, they have a lot of spots to be concerned about, different regions of the country where demographics are trending away from them. I mean, after the way Mitt Romney just failed to gain any traction in Ohio, even though he was doing five rallies a day there, there are three Ohio cities bidding for that. I mean, basically, they're saying, just put it anywhere in Ohio. And every presidential election, we hear Ohio is a big deal. So, yes, Denver's a place that's done it before. Yes, there's some nice symmetry bookending the Obama convention with a convention to replace Obama. But I kind of think that that may hurt Denver a little bit, the fact that it was just here so recently. The Democrats just did it. They may want to look for something else. And I think, you know, there's an ongoing debate in Republican circles about whether just the bid itself was the right thing for the Republican Party this year going into a really important midterm election. Got a great opportunity to win some top statewide races. Haven't done it in a decade. And a lot of Republican donors are being asked to, hey, forget about these campaigns who haven't raised much money right now. We need money to submit a bid for the convention. It's a bright, shiny object. It helps the city and the region economically. Some question about whether the bid process is really helping the Republican Party. 
And speaking of the Republican Party in Colorado, this week Republican Kerry Gardner made headlines when he announced that he will enter the race for the U.S. Senate seat currently held by Mark Udall. Gardner's announcement resulted in two Republican frontrunners dropping out of the race. A potential Gardner-Udall matchup has already put a national spotlight on the Colorado Senate race. Alicia Caldwell. The Denver Post had just had a debate with the Senate candidates, <laughs> what, a day before this happened? How do you see the Senate race shaping up? Um, it, it, uh, I mean, obviously, it's been the big political news of the week. It was a, a surprise to, to many people, including us, obviously. Um, the, with the Senate, with the GOP only needing six seats to claim the Senate, and and Cory Gardner is a likable candidate who does very well on the stump, who does well on the spot. It's going to be a big money race. Um, and, and it needs to be very fast if he's to have a chance. He has about 876000 in the bank uh, versus Mark Udall's $4.7 million. Um, that's going to change very rapidly, but but it has to. Now, now Cory Gardner is going to have to do a lot of things, kind of building this airplane as he flies. He's never done a statewide campaign. He's got to raise all this money to be able to to fight Udall. But he also has he has a record that's not exactly in step with centrist Colorado. You know, he's very hard right record if you look at it carefully on immigration. He favors personhood. Um, he's got uh, a number of different issues that he's going to have to explain to Colorado voters and try to position himself in the middle. Those votes, I think, played very well in the fourth CD, which is a far different place than, than Colorado in general, even though it seems to take up about half the space because it's gigantic. Uh, but it, it will be interesting to see how Cory Gardner remakes himself in the coming weeks and months. Brad, do you think e Cory's the answer for uh, the state Senate seat for the Republicans? Well, at least some of the other candidates in the race think so, because they sort of cleared the way for him. I was actually kind of surprised at the at the media response this week to this, that it was just, oh, this is the biggest shakeup we've seen in X number of years in Colorado politics. I mean, there's been a lot of interesting shakeups. Um, so Cory Gardner probably ranks in there somewhere, but it's not nearly the biggest. Um, I, I think... This year, uniquely, I agree with a lot of the things Alicia said about Corey's record and maybe how it plays better in the seat in CD4. But I remember sitting at the state capitol when when he was in the state house, and uh, you know he was pushing some bills that I think he can probably bring back around and talk about now. Things like health care reform. Obamacare is going to feature so uh, largely and centrally in this race that uh, some of those other issues, you know, they might work better if you don't have this giant elephant in the room. But look at Udall's record. I mean, he voted for it. Everybody's calling him, you know, the deciding vote. Um, and also, you've got this whole controversy about him trying to, his staff at least, and probably with his tacit approval, I guess, uh, trying to pressure the state into, you know, fudging the numbers a little bit uh, to make Obamacare look better. Uh, he does have some money in the bank. He's got far more money to transfer into his campaign than the other people did. Uh, I think the uh, one question we haven't talked about yet, though, is that is, is he... Um, Tea Party enough, actually, for some of the Tea Party elements of the of, of the Republican Party, because he's actually played it very safe in Congress. Um, I, I've, I've talked to people who have been sort of part of his inner circle that say he's, you know, he doesn't really want to be the first out on any issue. He's going to have to get used to that in a statewide race. Ed, how do you see Cory Gardner playing first in the primary and then if he makes it up against Udo? I don't think it's going to be much of a problem in the primary. Um, the one person who is left standing in the primary gets from this point is Owen Hill, who has the Tea Party Express backing. But Hill hasn't been raising a lot of money. Hill doesn't have a big profile. He's only in his second term, not even his second term, sorry, his second year as a state senator right now. And so uh, I think even if there might be questions about Cory Gardner's uh, conservatism, and, and I think a look at Cory's record would probably dash those pretty quickly, um, I don't even think think that Hill's got enough name recognition to rally around that. Um, it would be interesting to see. As far as playing against Udall, I think it's going to be very interesting. You know, if there is one thing that Gardner's been known for in Congress, he's been an all-in energy type guy. Um, you know, he, he was the lead sponsor of the bill, I believe, uh, to open up some more drilling areas in America. And so I would not be surprised to see Udall shift this race quickly to a bit more of an environmental race. I mean, Udall doesn't want to talk about his support for the president's Affordable Care Act right now. Um, and I think he's always been known as the guy that has gotten through in Colorado politics with being that outdoor 
outdoorsman, you know, the, the guy who, who won a lot of Western Slope counties in 2008 because people could relate to him. Uh, I think he'll quickly try to, you know, turn this and make this a, hey, I'm running against the guy that wants to pollute your air, and I'm Mark Udall. I'm the guy who wants to save the wildlife type race. Um, but uh, I am also very curious uh, what this does um, to the Andrew Romanoff race, because that was maybe the biggest deal for the Democrats in the state beforehand. Top congressional target, he was going to pull all the attention. Now a lot of national and state funding is going to be going to making sure Mark Udall keeps the seat. Is Andrew Romanoff going to be left a little bit out in the cold in his run against Mike, Ru Mike Kaufman because of this? Well, that's interesting. Eli, how do you see Gardner's chances both in the primary and if he makes it through against Udall? Primary is already over. Let's just be honest. The primary is done. Corey's the candidate. You can tell by the excitement. And I think the coronation that we saw this week is, is probably reflective of a party that's so desperate for a candidate who seems electable, just slightly electable uh, statewide, and a candidate who is able, for the most part, to unite a party that's been very fractured. So I think that's what Corey does, number one. He's a very careful guy. He's not the first guy out. So it tells you a lot that he's willing to risk it all on this race about Udall's vulnerability. I think Ed is correct that Udall may not want to talk about his votes on Obamacare, but he's going to have to. Mark Udall can say personhood, Cory Gardner will respond and say Obamacare. Mark Udall will say uh, immigration, House GOP, screwed up immigration, doesn't do anything. Cory Gardner will respond with one word, Obamacare. And so I think it's at the Democrats' peril, Mark Udall and all Democrats generally, they did this, they have to be able to defend it. And if they wander off with their tail between their leg and try to change the subject, try to run the same old Bennett model playbook that they've run before, they're going to look just as sheepish as Mark Udall looked on national TV when he couldn't answer whether he wanted the president to come here or not. I think that's what we're going to have to watch going forward. Well, and this is interesting because on the heels of Representative Gardner's announcement, Ken Buck announced that he will run for Gardner's vacant seat of the 4th Congressional District. But other state Republicans have expressed interest in the vacated seat, including State Senator Scott Renfro and, oh, escape, <laughs> Scott Renfro. <laughs> Brad, what do you think how Ken Buck's chances are going to be? Well, and I mean, there's a dot, dot, there's an ellipsis at the end of that sentence, Scott right, Renfrow, which is, correct. We, we, well, which is that, you know, there may be others too, right? This is going to coalesce over the next few weeks. Um, you know, with the, with the extended, I was going to mention, you know, with the extended election cycle, you know, it's like we're always running an election right now. Everybody's, all the media types around the table are bemoaning, you know, their, their debates that sort of went south because they don't matter anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, there's still a lot of time for these elections to, to, to coalesce. Um, I think Ken Buck, um, has learned a lot of lessons, right? I mean, he's been a figure, even when he was Weld County DA, was sort of a statewide figure because of all of the work that he was doing around illegal immigration, um, you know, and identity theft and all that. And then, of course, he ran for Senate. So uh, I, I think he's going to be able to clear the field pretty well. Um, I don't think this, and especially with redistricting, I don't think he has a whole lot to worry about with, with, with CD4. And, um, you know, getting to what Ed said about how uh, a lot of the shakeups at the top of the line are going to affect lower level races. If, if the Republicans are able to telegraph to all of their supporters, Ken Buck's a good guy, he's paid his dues, he can win this race, um, hopefully you'll see some assistance on his end to kind of clear the field. Ed, what do you think Ken's chances are on this? Well, I think they're pretty good. Um, you know, let's not forget, I, I think Amy Stevens had the most interesting statement when she got into the Senate race where Buck was the presumable Republican favorite and said, look, we want a new person. You know, we, we don't want to repeat the loss of 2010. But as Alicia said, CD4 is not the state of Colorado. I mean, this is one that he could win pretty easily. Um, I'm curious how much there was that um, agreement. Like, hey, look, you know, if you, if you drop out, you go for CD4. We we will help clear the field for you. I think the most interesting name I've seen thrown out there actually is not Renfro, who does have a pretty big profile and will probably have some great Tea Party and Club for Growth backing if he tries to, to make this run. Um, but Sean Conway, the Weld County Commissioner, who was known for you know being one of the spokespeople for the 51st State Movement, but before that, Conway was the Chief of Staff for Wayne Allard. So he's got a lot of people he can call on that he knows over the years if he really wants to make this race. And he is a local guy that's known very well in one of the most populous counties in that district. So I think that'll be the interesting name to watch. What names do you think we should be watching in this one, Eli? All of those. I would also throw out Jerry Sonnenberg, state rep from Sterling, and B.J. Nickel, a former state rep from Loveland. B.J. is really interesting because unlike this sort of old white male club, 
Ken Buck, all these other folks. And I don't know that Ken's going to ha have the field cleared for him. I mean, anytime you have a, a safe seat like this, that basically you make it through a primary, you're a congressman or con congresswoman for life. See Diana DeGette, see Doug Lamborn. That's how it works. So it's going to be a free for all. They're all going to come out and take a look at this. And I think that BJ has a chance as a, you know, Douglas County's part of this district now parts of Douglas County. So I think there's there's a chance for someone who is a woman. The Republicans need women in office uh, and someone who's a little bit more moderate on social issues. If there's a primary and it's a robust wide open field and there's all these guys like uh, you know Ken Buck and Sean Conway and um, and Renfro out there trying to sort of out conservative one another. I think there could be a path for someone like BJ Nickel if she decides to get in. Alicia do you think that might be a way that the way it'll go? Uh, you know I don't think it, there was, there's been a lot of talk about uh, from Owen Hill, for instance, on the backroom deals that uh, that went on to kind of create this shuffle. I don't think these people were involved in that deal. The, the people we've been talking about, whose names are surfacing, and it is a pretty plum job, as others have mentioned. So, you know, I don't think there's going to necessarily be an agreement on who the candidate is, and I'm not so sure they're so afraid of Ken Buck. Um, he has not really. It, I, he's made a name for himself, but not always in a good way. Um, so I think they see him as vulnerable. I think that's why you see some some of these names surfacing. Um, I think I, I agree with Eli. I think that B.J. Nickel could give him a run. Um, she isn't as well known as Ken Buck for sure, um, but she does bring something to the table that that he doesn't. A little bit more diversity in the sense, you know, a woman who's a little more, a little less conservative on social issues, um, yet understands how things work. She served in the State House for a number of years. So, so no, it'll be, uh, it, 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 there's nothing set in stone here in this primary. It'll be, it'll be interesting to watch. And we have more than three months to the primary, so yeah. we'll be talking about this a lot again. But in the meantime, Arapahoe County District Court Judge Carlos Samora set October 14th as the start date for the Aurora Theater murder trial. A report released last week regarding sanity evaluations of the alleged shooter revealed that Judge Samora will appoint a new independent doctor to do the evaluation after the current one refused to meet with prosecutors. Ed, how long do you think this trial is going to take? We will know who our U.S. senator is before we know the outcome of this trial. I mean, at this point, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but as I'm watching some of the things that are going on, it seems like the defense strategy is lengthen it out. Let's try to keep this going a little bit longer. And, and it seems to me the only reason they would be wanting to do that, because Let's face it, this is a pretty open and shut case if they don't get the insanity ruling. Um, the only reason they would seem to want to lengthen it out so much is maybe we will break Brauschler. Maybe he will decide, oh, the hell with it. I will take your offer of life without parole. We will let the guy live. Let's just put him in jail. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I've seen Brauschler speak, and he is a pretty, you know, he's pretty passionate about this. And the victim's family seem pretty passionate about going the way that he wants to go, too, seeking the death penalty. Um, but as as long as the defense thinks that is a potential outcome, I bet we're going to see it. I mean, it's fascinating, uh, reading the Denver Post this week, that 6,000 people are going to be called for jury selection, one of the largest jury pools ever. I mean, just the jury selection alone could take a month at this point. So um, I'm not expecting anything quick. I think we have a lawyer-free table. I could be wrong. So, <laughs> Eli, what do you? How do you see this trial going? Uh, you know, not being, not this not being my area, it's it's hard to really comment. It's it seems like it is going to drag on and on and on. And the second mental evaluation is something that's going to delay. Um, and that is something that I think. I mean, George Brockler's all in on this death penalty uh, case. And I think that's tough. That's a risk because had they taken a deal, it'd be over. There'd be resolution for the families. And so, you know, I look at it, and I, I know George, and I talk to George about it. And if this had been over earlier, George could be running for governor. We'd be talking about something completely different. I think that th he's he's a new DA, and he's a guy with a lot of upside. And how this goes and how this plays out. Um, could determine how people look at him. I think it's unfortunate for the families that this is going to be dragged on as long as it will be, but I think that's just sort of the nature of these death penalty cases when you have something that is this big and is this, you know, everybody knows about it. I mean, selecting a jury, like Ed said, is going to take maybe a month in itself, so it's going to be a while. And it also means we're going to be talking about the death penalty a lot right as the election is coming up. Alicia, do you think that'll affect things? 
Well, you know, I think this case is an illustration of why there ought to be, if, if you believe in it, why there ought to be a further discussion about the death penalty. The reason this case has gotten so complex, and I'm going to disagree a little bit with Ed, isn't necessarily because of the defense. It's because of the prosecution. The prosecution asked for a second evaluation. To me, that says, and I have no inside knowledge and it's not been stated publicly, to me that says that the first evaluation was unfavorable to the prosecution. It showed him to be insane. They want another opinion. So this is going to drag out um, over, uh, th this will be years before the, the, probably 10 years before the appeals are over if they get, if the prosecution gets over the insanity hurdle. And that's a, you know, that's a perfect illustration or a perfect example of why the death penalty, we're very conflicted as a society about the death penalty and that, and I can, you know, I can understand why the judge is being very careful about this. He doesn't want this case to come back. He doesn't want to make a mistake. But it also just shows how difficult this decision is. And you know, if you're inclined to argue against the death penalty and think that it should be brought up in the legislature, this is a perfect case to illustrate this because it's the jury selection will take months, 6,000 jurors, and then the trial will probably take eight months or something along those lines. I mean, this thing's going to go on. We're going to put kids through college before this is over. Brett, do you think that death penalty will kind of be the backdrop, that discussion of the election because of this? Well, something uh, that hasn't been mentioned here, and it's just a theory, is, you know, if, if it does drag on past the election, and there's every indication it will, right, we're going to have possibly a new governor, right, a new governor who may be better disposed toward the death penalty than our current governor who, yeah, well, and we're going to have a debate during the gubernatorial election because Hickenlooper just sort of couldn't make up a decisive mind. Did he, you know, did he want to stay the execution or not? He just punted down the road. And so I wonder if that dynamic, especially if you have a governor, a Republican maybe, who's well disposed toward the, the death penalty, you know, he certainly wouldn't be executed given how these things go in the next four years or five years, right, while the next governor sits. But it would certainly play into where is the state going on this, right? It doesn't make any sense to sentence somebody to death if the public debate starts leaning toward doing away with the death penalty anyway. And you go through all of this trouble and then all of a sudden the execution has stayed and it doesn't matter. Well, and we'll be talking about this topic for a long time, but now we have five more minutes, so let's talk quickly about a new thing that happened this week. The State Air Quality Control Commission adopted rules this past weekend that make Colorado the first state in the nation to limit methane emissions. The new rules were supported by some oil companies in Colorado, but opposed by the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. Eli, do you think these new rules in Colorado will prompt other states to follow our lead? I don't know if I think that'll be a long time, although I do think that part of the reason the industry, Exxon, Chevron, the big players came in at the end and tried to weaken these rules is because they, they knew that if Colorado went ahead and did this, it would be precedent setting and it would be something that other states can look at down the road and say, okay, we can regulate methane and this is a model for how to do it. So big play by the industry, huge win for the environmental community and huge win for the governor who really put together this coalition and got the three biggest operators in this state to sign on. I don't think these rules, as tough of a rule, would have gone through intact if not for that coalition. But it's not helping the governor at all with the fractivists. They still want to ban this whole thing outright and good luck with the local control issue this fall. Alicia, quick take on your feelings on this one. Well, the methane regulations alone are going to likely draw a court challenge. I mean, currently the U.S. Supreme Court is hearing uh, a case involving whether the EPA has the jurisdiction to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, and that's what methane is. That's why it's being regulated here because of its potential, you know, to to mix up um, and create um, some um, carbon. Uh, well, I won't go into it. You said quick <laughs> take, but but um, I do think it's going to be watched nationwide, and it does has uh, have potential to. Um, change how other states do business in terms of regulation. Brad, is Colorado leading the way here? Well, Alicia mentioned the, the CO2 ruling, which I think is going to directly impact this. I mean, you know, these are naturally occurring, you know, uh, compounds. It's not, you know, a pollutant that's novel to uh, the oil and gas industry. Um, but it's interesting, too, that as you have these regulations put in place, some members of industry sort of are in favor of this, right? And a lot of times you have a regulation like this that's a little bit subjective. Maybe it's worse for the bigger players, right? You have um, industry using regulations to essentially harm their competition, right? It's not about public health anymore. It's about how can we game all of these new regulations to harm uh, the other guy who's fracking down the road. 
And Ed, do you think it's a win for Hickenlooper? I think it is because he can say, look, I got all these people together. And in fact, you know, as Eli mentioned, I had the three biggest players in the state on, on board here. The funny thing is, though, I don't think it, Colorado may be leading, but I don't think anyone's going to follow. This was too nuanced. It was too much work. It was too much compromise. And that's just not the style of politics. And if anything, you saw that by the fact that the um, uh, initiative to give more local control over fracking was filed while these hearings were going on. They didn't care what was happening. They wanted something more extreme than had come. And that will be another topic we're going to be able to talk about as the time goes on. But in the meantime, it's our favorite time, the disgrace of the week. Alicia. Well, I'm, it's a little harsh for a disgrace, but the fashion faux pas of the week goes to Jared Polis for his <laughs> bow tie, jacket, polo shirt uh, combination. Thank goodness for GQ and its fashion intervention. I know. What does he think? He's on this panel? Brad. <laughs> uh, Vladimir Putin and his thuggish ways. I read an article this week about how, you know, uh, on every front, basically, of any uh, former Soviet country right now, he's trying to project his power. And the media, especially during the Olympics, when they should have had a magnifying glass on him, had no magnifying glass whatsoever. Ed, who do you want to turn your magnifying glass on? The religious liberty law vetoed by Arizona Governor Jan Brewer was poorly written and overly focused. But what will be even worse than that law is if this ends the discussion that is needed about religious liberty for business owners. While we're all talking right now about Christians versus gays, the rules are being interpreted so broadly, it's not long before you're going to see a Jewish videography business forced to make an anti-Semitic video for a client or a Muslim exhibition hall owner forced to host an event for clients that disagree with large tenets of their religion. This is a much bigger issue than Christians versus gays, and this debate shouldn't end here. And Eli, your disgrace. Uh, the Denver Nuggets. I watched the game last <laughs> night. Enough said. We just have a minute, so say something nice very quickly. Uh, it's basketball related. Uh, Jason Collins for uh, his number 98 jersey, um, remembering um, Matthew Shepard, who died in 1998 as a result of anti-gay violence. Brad? Uh, all of my friends who just came online as the first paid firefighters at the South Adams County Fire Department after 60 years almost as an all-volunteer department. Congratulations to them all. Absolutely. Ed? It seems like five years ago that Amy Stevens was in the Senate race, but the day of the debate, she went to the legislature and vigorously defended her health exchange bill that she knew she was going to get pilloried on. It's nice to see a politician stand up for something that's not popular within their party. And Eli? That's a good one. Um, Jan Brewer for avoiding the bigotry apocalypse in Arizona and perhaps the country. And that's all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Patricia Calhoun. Thanks for watching. Good night. Mm -hmm.